Open the podcast bay door as hell. Episode 13 of Welcome to Geek Town. I'm your host, Kurt Onstead. I've been a proud geek all my life, being into role-playing games, board games, sci-fi, fantasy, and especially superheroes and comics. And I want to help others join me in those pursuits. But I've found that sometimes people can get overwhelmed or feel left out because they don't already have what some consider to be the requisite knowledge to be considered a fan. And that's where Welcome to Geek Town comes in. Here you can ask your questions without feeling like a gatekeeper is calling you out for not yet being fully versed in every aspect of your new interest. Before we get into the question this time, I have a couple of corrections and clarifications to make. First off, I have to apologize to my guest from last episode. I pronounced his name as Matt Dabra. But I found out after I had released the episode that it's pronounced Matt Dobra. As he put it, rhymes with Cobra. That was a complete oversight on my part, having learned his name by reading it and never getting clarification on pronunciation. Although you've already received them privately, let me add my apologies here in public, Dr. Dobra. And thank you again for your time and expertise. I've heard nothing but compliments about that episode. Next, I had a follow-up question from Joel L. regarding episode 10. He wrote in saying, quote, You said that the robot you were talking about would have been referred to as an android in today's common nomenclature. This has always confused me. Could you give a real quick differentiation between robot, android, cyborg, and any other commonly used words that describe some form of mobile artificial intelligence? Sure thing, Joel. So, let's start with a robot, since we actually have them in real life. A robot is generally defined as a mechanical creation that has been designed to perform complex physical tasks with at least some autonomy. This broad definition allows us to include real-world devices like manufacturing robots, self-driving cars, and autonomous drones, as well as including fictional creations like R2-D2, WALL-E, and all of the Transformers. Now, an android is a subtype of robot who was specifically designed to appear humanoid. There's been some work towards this in our own world, but these are mostly still in the realm of science fiction. All of the time-traveling Terminators would be included here, as well as Ash and Bishop from the Alien movies. And, as he will point out over and over again, Star Trek's Data. Why do you have yellow eyes? I am an android. You're not human. I am an android. You sound like you don't want to be an android. I am an android. I am an android. android. Your question stems from when I pointed out in episode 10 that the robots of the play that introduced the word to the world as a whole, R-U-R, were more accurately described as androids. For a modern comparison, the creatures in this play most closely resemble the replicants from Blade Runner, a term created specifically for that movie. The robots of R-U-R and replicants are both organic creatures, but ones that were designed and created by men for their specific purpose. Speaking of organic creatures, the next term you used was cyborg. Cyborgs aren't actually artificial intelligence, as they are creatures who were born naturally, but have had some permanent mechanical alteration or addition done to their body sometimes to replace a missing or damaged body part, 
other times simply to enhance the abilities of their current body. Some of the more famous examples would include Winter Soldier from the Marvel books and movies, the Borg from Star Trek, and Darth Vader from Star Wars. There are even cyborgs in real life, as high-end prosthetic limbs get more and more complex and computerized, allowing people to even feel heat, cold, and pressure through replacement limbs. I hope that clears things up for you, Joel. Now, Having just mentioned Darth Vader, let's get into today's question, as the Sith Lord and his family saga are involved. We have another question from Reddit, with user SuddenStop1405 asking, What's the difference between fantasy and science fiction, and where does Star Wars fit into that? Thanks for the question. I've always found it interesting that science fiction and fantasy get lumped together, especially in bookstores, libraries, and the like, as they sometimes feel like polar opposites. Science fiction looks towards the future, while fantasy is often set in the past, or at least in a world that feels like the past. I know lots of people who are fans of one, but not the other. However, Both science fiction and fantasy fall under the broader banner of speculative fiction, which can also include supernatural horror, utopian and dystopian fiction, and my personal favorite, superheroes. Anytime the world depicted is substantially different from the one that exists or that we have known to exist, it's covered by the speculative fiction or specfic, umbrella. So, now that we see how they're connected, let's look at how they differ. As I mentioned before, science fiction tends to be a future-looking genre. Many of the stories are set in a possible future, or at least they were when they were written. 2001 has come and gone, but I haven't seen any star babies, have you? So, whether it's the near future in something like Westworld, or the far-flung future of Isaac Asimov's Foundation series, we see that technology has advanced in one form or another to make the world different from the one we're experiencing today. If humanity's technology hasn't advanced, then there will most often be an alien presence to bring more futuristic tech into the story. But in some way or another, if you want to make a science fiction story, there's got to be some sort of technological or otherwise scientific breakthrough that does not yet exist in our world. Whether that's the genetic engineering of Jurassic Park, the faster-than-light travel from Star Trek, and Star Wars, but we'll get to that, or the time travel of Edge of Tomorrow. While we're on the subject of science fiction, and we're categorizing things, let's talk about hard sci-fi versus soft sci-fi. In hard sci-fi, the author is generally careful to stick to known scientific principles and extrapolate technological breakthroughs based on current scientific thought. In these stories, often the science involved is not just integral to the plot, but is the subject of the story itself. To use an early example, From the Earth to the Moon by Jules Verne, which was discussed in a previous episode, is less about the character's motivation and struggles, but deals more with the science involved in making such a trip possible. A more recent example, although still over 20 years old, is the film Contact, based on the Carl Sagan novel. If you haven't read the book or seen the movie, it's about man's first contact with aliens, but no spaceships come flying down to destroy all of our landmarks, nor is there faster-than-light subspace communication. Instead, the fact that information takes years to travel from one location to another in the vastness of space is an important part of the story, and all of the other scientific explanations are kept as close to reality as possible as well. 
In soft sci-fi, however, scientific accuracy isn't as important of a goal. Most authors will try for at least a semblance of science in their science fiction, but in soft sci-fi, you'll more often hear what has come to be known as technobabble. Best known from its use in Star Trek, technobabble is when scientific-sounding words are strung together in order to make it feel like actual science is being discussed. For instance, here's a brief bit from Star Trek The Next Generation, talking about altering the transporter to cure a character of an aging disease. Well, I'd have to get into the biofilter bus and patch in a molecular matrix reader. That's no problem. But the waveform modulator will be overloaded without the regeneration limiter in the first stage circuit. Sounds pretty, right? But it doesn't actually mean much of anything, because none of these things actually exist. Compare that to a movie and book like The Martian, where author Andy Weir used all of his engineering knowledge to make every problem and solution as realistic and scientifically accurate as possible. And I think you get the idea. Now, even soft sci-fi will usually do what it can to make it seem like what's happening in the story is in the realm of possibility. When we get into fantasy, however, that all goes out the window. In fantasy, we meet wizards, dragons, and other mythical and magical creatures. Fantasy stories, whether they be on the page or on the screen, have their own set of rules that don't conform to our knowledge of physics and biology as they exist today. Now, it's important for a good fantasy tale that those rules be consistent within the confines of the story, otherwise readers or watchers will find it hard to continue to suspend disbelief. But as long as you stay internally consistent, your imagination is the limit with what can and can't exist in a fantasy world. Now, where does Star Wars fit into all this? Let me start by noting that I'm limiting my classification to just the films, as that's what most people are familiar with. Also, the books, cartoons, and stories from the various games are not always considered canon, and so will sometimes step outside of the bounds of their original genre. I think we can all agree the movies are definitely not hard sci-fi. There's never any rigorous scientific explanations for the technology, like blasters, hyperdrives, or droids. And outside of the character L337 in the Han Solo movie, the films don't discuss the rights and wrongs of technology, like, should droids be treated like people? Or, do moisture evaporators do more harm than good to Tatooine's ecology? So, like I said, we can rule out hard sci-fi. What about soft sci-fi? Well, we do have futuristic technology and aliens, which are some of the hallmarks of a soft sci-fi story. However, there's one aspect of Star Wars that I've been very specifically avoiding talking about. The Force. This is arguably the world-building aspect that sets Star Wars apart from most every other sci-fi show, movie, and book. Now, some other sci-fi has people with powers similar to the Jedi and the Sith, like mind-reading, telekinesis, and the like. But few present it as a philosophy and a religion the way George Lucas did when he first introduced us to Obi-Wan Kenobi and Darth Vader. Although he tried later to drape it in a sci-fi veneer by introducing the concept of midichlorians, the fan response to that was so vehemently against it, midichlorians have been basically left out of canon since then. Whether or not they were conscious of it, my feeling is, fans were rejecting the addition of science fiction in their fantasy. It may be space fantasy, but it is fantasy nonetheless. George Lucas famously used Joseph Campbell's ideas of the monomyth and the hero's journey as the template for the original Star Wars movie, 
making Star Wars, or A New Hope if you prefer, a modern myth. And while that myth may have some of the trappings of a science fiction story, the themes and ideas within, especially relating to the Force, place Star Wars firmly in the fantasy realm. Now, this is just my thought on the subject. Do you agree or disagree with my assessment? Let me know your feelings, or if you have a question on a different topic, you can email that to me at welcome to geektown at gmail.com, or leave a comment directly on the show notes at www.welcome to, the number two, geektown.com. While you're there, be sure to check the Amazon links to some of the stories we've discussed. Other contact options include facebook.com slash welcome to geektown, or Twitter at Geektown Podcast. In the meantime, don't forget to subscribe and give me a five-star review over on iTunes to join the Geektown City Council so you can help other people find the show and we can all tell them, Welcome to Geektown, Population Us. Welcome to Geektown is written, narrated, edited, and produced by me, Kurt Ofsted. Theme music is by Aaron Lovitz, logo art by Archie Santana. All other sound clips are the copyrighted material of their respective owners, and no infringement is intended, following the